Hi, and welcome to our second discussion on biological molecules here in our matter unit. In this video, we're going to focus on nucleic acids and proteins, which are the other two major groups of biological molecules, aside from the carbohydrates and lipids that we talked about in our last video. Proteins are really, really cool molecules, and they do a lot of really cool things. I could have really started this video by talking to you about numerous different examples, but I thought for the purpose of this one, I would talk to you about Crow Farini, who lived in the 19th century, and you see her pictured here. Crow had a condition known as hypertrichosis. You can probably see what the phenotype is here in this picture of her with her adopted father. Hypertrichosis is excessive hair growth all over your body. This is one hair magnified, and if we could magnify it even further down to the molecular level, which of course we can't, we would see that in fact, Hair is made out of a protein called keratin. This is a model of the keratin protein. You have it all over your body. It's also the main ingredient in your fingernails. And for whatever reason, people with hypertrichosis produce much more of this in much more places on their body than people quote unquote normally do. So with that in mind, let's go in and let's talk about proteins and nucleic acids so that we can start to understand how they result in things like our hair and our nails and even conditions like hypertrichosis. We're going to be investigating the same question here that we were in our previous video, which is what are living things made of? And in this video, we're going to talk about nucleic acids briefly, and then we're going to talk about proteins in depth. If you remember to the last video, I showed you a picture of a food that had carbohydrates and lipids, and here I'm showing you a picture of a food that has a lot of protein, which of course are eggs. I could have just as easily gone with meat, but meat doesn't really photograph well. We're going to start by talking about nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are DNA molecules and RNA molecules, and these are made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but also nitrogen and phosphorus. Nucleic acids are technically the polymers of nucleotide monomers. And I've got one example of a nucleotide monomer here in this picture. This is the nucleotide known as adenine. Now, for reasons that you don't really need to worry about, when nucleotides exist by themselves, they're actually referred to as nucleosides. And so technically this isn't adenine, it's adenosine. But you don't really need to worry about that. At the same time, I figured I should mention it since you will see it and you should know that these terms are functionally interchangeable. For the purpose of our discussion, I'm going to use the term nucleotide. It's just what I'm used to using. When we look at nucleotides, they all have the same basic structure. They've got at least one phosphate group and perhaps as many as three. They've got a five carbon sugar, which could be either ribose or deoxyribose, depending upon whether or not we're talking about RNA or DNA. And then they've got nitrogenous bases. There are four nitrogenous bases in DNA and four nitrogenous bases in RNA. We'll talk a lot more about nucleic acid structure in our information unit, but for right now, this is really what you should be familiar with. As a brief comparison for our introductory purposes, you should understand that there are some differences between DNA and RNA, specifically the number of strands. RNA has one strand of nucleotides, whereas DNA has two strands of nucleotides. The type of sugar is slightly different. RNA is ribose and DNA is deoxyribose. And the types of nitrogenous bases. In RNA, there's cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. And in DNA, there's cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. We generally refer to these bases by one letter shorthands, C, G, A, T, and U. Nucleic acids function as the information storage and expression vehicle inside of cells. Instructions are stored in the nucleus of cells in DNA molecules. Those instructions are then copied into RNA molecules if they're going to be expressed in the cell. And then the information in RNA is used to produce proteins. It's the action of proteins combined with the action of the environment that leads to phenotypes or traits in an organism. We talked a bit about this in our last unit, and it turns out that it's really important, which is why you're seeing it again here. But outside of this sort of macro level understanding, you don't need to understand too much else about how nucleic acids function for the purpose of this unit. Like I said, they're going to get an entire unit all to themselves a little bit later on in the course. Proteins are biological molecules that are made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and occasionally sulfur. The monomer of a protein is an amino acid, and you see the general structure of an amino acid here in this image. We've got an amino group, that NH2 group, and a carboxyl group, which functions as an acid on the other side. That's that C, double bonded to the O, single bonded to the OH, which is why they're called amino acids. Every amino acid has the same basic structure. The thing that differs between individual amino acids is the R group. This is a chart of the different types of amino acids that we see in biological systems. Most systems use 20 different varieties. 
And you can see the R groups, which are hanging down off of the amino acid in each of these pictures. And the R groups can vary quite a bit. They can be as simple as an individual hydrogen atom, or they can include large elaborate ring structures. Among the 20 types of amino acids that we normally see, we see that some have a positive charge, some have a negative charge, some are totally hydrophobic, others are hydrophilic and some, specifically cysteine and methionine, have incorporated sulfur into their structures. When we join amino acids together, we join them by a peptide bond, which is a covalent bond that forms between the oxygen and hydrogen of the carboxyl group of the first amino acid and one of the hydrogens of the amino group of the next amino acid in the chain. This is the only way that amino acids are put together in biological systems. And we see that, of course, it is yet again another example of dehydration synthesis. A chain of amino acids is generally referred to as a polypeptide chain. And once they're actually incorporated into that polypeptide chain, they're no longer referred to as amino acids. They're referred to as amino acid residues. You should be able to look at a chain of amino acid residues joined together and identify the peptide bonds that are holding the individual amino acids together. Because there are 20 different types of amino acids that we can incorporate into a polypeptide chain of a large length, proteins have by far the most complicated structures out of any of the biological molecules. Proteins have what is by far the most complicated structures out of any of the biological molecules. When we consider protein structure, we break it apart into four different levels of analysis. The primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. Each level refers to a different series of structural elements that we see in a polypeptide chain, and each one is a result of different types of interactions among the amino acid residues in the chain. We're going to go through each one in turn. The primary structure of a polypeptide chain is simply the sequence of amino acids in that chain. This is the information that is ultimately determined by DNA sequences in the cell. When people refer to genes, they're generally referring to one set of instructions for one particular polypeptide chain's primary structure. The primary structure of any polypeptide chain is, of course, the result of the peptide bonds that are holding together those individual amino acids. Secondary structure is the regularly repeating three-dimensional structures that start to arise when we put amino acids together. The three-dimensional secondary structures come from hydrogen bonds in the non-R group atoms, or what we call the backbone of the polypeptide chain. Hydrogen bonds will form between the hydrogens on the amino groups and the double-bonded oxygens in what used to be the carboxyl groups of the amino acid backbone, and this will cause the polypeptide chain to form regularly repeating three-dimensional structures. These are structures that are largely universal in all proteins. The image is showing you two of the most common ones, which are the alpha helices, spirals of amino acids, and the beta pleated sheet structure. When we move up a level of structure to the tertiary structure, now we're referring to the overall specific three-dimensional structure of the polypeptide chain. This is due to the interactions between the R groups of the different amino acids that make up the chain. Some R groups will be repelled from the watery environment and will try to orient themselves inside of the polypeptide chain away from the aqueous environment of the cell. Other ones will be attracted to that aqueous environment. Some will be attracted to each other. Positively charged R group atoms will be attracted to negatively charged R group atoms or be repelled from similarly charged ones. We'll get hydrogen bonds that form between polar R groups and we'll even get full covalent bonds that form between the sulfurs of cysteine residues, making structures known as disulfide bridges. The specific details of these interactions are not really important for you to understand, but what you do need to understand is the sum total of these interactions that lead to the overall three-dimensional shape of a particular polypeptide chain. Now, of course, we don't want to keep saying overall three-dimensional shape of a particular polypeptide chain. We would prefer to have one word to use to describe that. And so the word that we use that describes that is the conformation of the protein. When we talk about the conformation of any structure, we're talking about its specific three-dimensional shape. But it's a term that gets used mostly when we talk about protein structure. Quaternary structure is what happens when a particular protein needs to be made out of more than one polypeptide chain put together. Some proteins are the functional unit as one singular polypeptide chain. Other proteins need to combine multiple polypeptide chains in order to make the functional unit. The image is showing you the hemoglobin protein, which is what's responsible for carrying blood throughout our bodies. The hemoglobin protein is made out of four different polypeptide chains put together. The interactions that hold polypeptide chains together are very similar to the interactions that occur to produce a protein's tertiary structure, only now the interactions are between different chains instead of within the amino acids in one chain. We need to analyze proteins at these multiple different levels of structure because of what proteins do in our cells. 
Unlike carbohydrates and lipids and even nucleic acids, which serve a relatively limited range of functions, proteins accomplish a huge variety of cellular functions. In fact, they're responsible for accomplishing all of the work that goes on inside of a cell. What we mean by that is anything that a cell does, it does through the action of proteins. The image over on the right shows a series of cells, each of which has been stained for proteins in different organelles inside of the cell. And you can see that in each of the organelles inside of these cells, there are plenty of proteins present. In the middle here, we have four different proteins, just as examples of some of the things that proteins do. The first is an antibody molecule, which is used in your immune system to help defend against pathogens. The next is a transport molecule. That is a three-dimensional model of the hemoglobin protein. Proteins play an important role in chemical signaling. They're the other major class of hormones. This particular protein is the hormone insulin. And proteins play major roles in overall cell metabolism. This particular protein is the enzyme adenylate kinase, whose entire job is to stick phosphate molecules onto adenine nucleotides. Every step of every biochemical process inside of a cell is largely controlled through the action of protein enzymes. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of different proteins in every cell in your body, each of which is responsible for a different part of the overall processes that are working inside of a cell. Because proteins are so complicated in their structure, but also so important, people are deeply interested in determining and representing the structure of different proteins. This poster is showing a series of different proteins, which are being represented here in a variety of different ways to spotlight different elements that are important to understanding the overall function of those different proteins. The role that any protein plays in the cell is due to the structure of that protein. If you alter the structure of the protein, you're going to change the functions that that protein can carry out. This is what's called denaturation. To get a handle on what this looks like, let's consider our friend from the beginning, a raw egg. If we wanted to consider the proteins inside of that raw egg, we could think about them as being in their current functional conformations. But when we cook the egg, we wind up totally denaturing those proteins. We alter their structures, which completely and irrevocably changes their functions. Cooking is not the only factor that can denature protein, though certainly it is a major one. Other factors inside of the cell that can also affect the structure of a protein include things like pH, the concentration of various salts, and the presence or absence of various molecules that might interact with the protein directly. Depending upon the specifics of the protein involved and the nature of the denaturation, the effects of the denaturation may be able to be reversed if you change the conditions, or like in the case of our cooked egg, they can be irreversible. Thanks so much for watching our discussion about nucleic acid and protein structure and function. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can describe the structural characteristics of nucleic acids and proteins. You definitely want to be able to recognize them if you see them. Also make sure you can explain how nucleic acids and proteins contribute to biological systems, Explain how every level of a protein structure contributes to the overall structure and function of that protein. Make sure you can predict the effects of changes to a protein structure. And explain how structural variations in nucleic acids and proteins contribute to functional variations. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.